Welcome to the webinar on competition law and practice. This webinar is going to give you a lot of interesting information about competition law. It will tell you about the basics, the fundamentals, and it will also go into the relevant information, uh, the relevance of competition law in recent times. So there's a lot of interesting content to be covered. We will also be telling you about Locktopus Law, Locktopus law School's online course on competition law and practice. And then there'll be a doubt clearing session at the end where you can ask our faculty any doubts that you have about competition law and specifically whatever has been covered in this webinar. So as you all know, today we have our faculty with us. We have Nidhi Singh, we have Saksham Malik. They are esteemed professionals in the field of competition law and they will be here to teach us about this exciting area of law and they will also be the faculty for our course. So just to give a very brief introduction about the faculty that we have here today. So Nidhi has a very interesting profile so she has worked with the Competition Commission of India. She's worked at Trilegal. She has, she's currently a fellow at Stanford Law School pursuing antitrust laws. She's also pursued law and finance at University of Oxford. She's also studied from Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She's also completed economics for competition law from King's College London. And she has definitely, and she's also working at, as a faculty at GLA University. So Nidhi has an eclectic profile and a lot of experience in competition law. And I'm sure all of you will have an exciting time learning about competition law from her. We have Saksham Malik with us. Saksham, who is a policy expert at competition law. He's a consultant, he's a lawyer, and he has worked in a lot of civil society think tanks like the Dialogue and many others. And his work mainly revolves around antitrust technology and human rights law. And he has a very interesting area of research in competition law where he focuses on other thematic areas such as IPR, data privacy, gender issues, which and their interplay with competition law. And this is a very unique perspective he brings to in this area. He will be covering that in the webinar too. So without further ado, I would give it over to the panelists we have here to take forward the session. Thank you all for attending and I hope you have a great time. So uh, before we begin, we just wanted to understand which year are you all in? What are you pursuing right now? Uh, is anybody working here? Just a little bit about your background, just to get an idea about who we have here today and you know where are all of you coming from? Are you people still students? Are you, okay, we have a final year LLB uh, student here. We have someone from second year. We have a fourth year student. We have corporate lawyers too. We have a third year student, all right. We have another third year student. We have a fifth year, third year student. Interesting, okay. All right. We have a second year student too, okay. We have a PhD scholar. We have a first year student. We have first year students, final year students. Okay, so that seems like we have quite a few lawyers and we have quite a few final year and senior level students. We do have a couple of first, second year students too. This is really helpful. Thank you so much for writing in your answers. And okay, hi Pooja, you are from fourth year, all right. Okay, so uh, thanks for this information. We will begin with Nidhi's presentation now. She will be covering the introduction to competition law. Okay, we have an MBA professional also. That's quite interesting. So you will find the session very relevant and you'll definitely find our course also quite relevant. So without further ado, I will hand over the mic to Nidhi. So uh, Nidhi, we would like to begin the session now. Uh, so a very, uh, very good evening to all of you. Thank you all for joining in on a uh, Monday evening. And uh, I will take you through quickly through the a brief introduction about the competition law in India. Uh, obviously, we will be doing with this uh, uh, the entire uh, provisions of law uh, pertaining to competition uh, law in India during this uh, course that we will pursue uh, through the medium of law of the school. But uh, the idea behind this session is take you to the uh, briefly to the contours of the Indian competition law and uh, uh, what is the underlying principle behind which uh, a regulatory framework is as such made. So, uh, like, I would like to start from very basic, very basic. That what do you understand by competition? What is it that is uh, important for you 
uh, uh, in order to uh, impose competition? What is the kind of law which is being made by the uh, any country uh, to ensure that the competition sustains in the economy? So, uh, if I have to understand in a very layman's term that what do you understand by competition and why is it important? I would say that you know competition as such is an act of competing. You know when firms as such come together and they compete with each other, right? And what happens when a, when two firms compete? The consumer who is who, for instance, in this case would be you and I. We end up getting the best possible prices, best possible quantity, best possible quality of product. And the services that we require from the market, that we require to pick from the market, and antitrust laws, the competition law. So the law, the United States, the term originated from the United States, so it's called the antitrust law in the U.S. I would not go into why it is called the antitrust law. That we do it in detail when we do the course. But just for reference, I'm telling you, it might be I might be using it through the course of the lecture. So uh, competition law is called antitrust in the US. So uh, for antitrust laws, as such, you know, they encourage the companies to compete. So what happens so that both the consumers and businesses, you and I, would end up benefit. And one important benefit of the competition is innovation. Because I know, so for example, you know, uh, uh, when two people are competing in class and you have friends amongst each other, you know, you're writing exams and you are competing with each other. So you would see, you know, somebody who's working hard and you want to score better than him. You end up innovating, right? You want to make your answers more innovative. You go to various resources. You want to make your answers better. So you're pushed to do better, right? And similarly, when if the course is based on a pass fail basis, for instance, you know that you just based on the completion, you'll be marked ten out of ten. So everybody would perform the same. But the moment there is competition, there is also an incentive. Is essential. But why is law needed? Why is law needed? Law is needed, you know, at a point where you and I are competing, but then, you know, our motives change, our intentions change, and you and I come together and we think, you know, why not, you know, both of us are champions in the market. Let's dominate the market. Let's try to change the market. So, what we do is that, you know, uh, you and I come together and we enter into some sort of a, you know, unsaid agreement and uh, unwritten agreement and uh, try to control the market in a way so that is advantageous to only both of us but disadvantageous to the other consumers. Now, how will this be disadvantageous? For instance, you and I come together and we try to fix prices for any product, right? So the consumers who could have had a better opportunity to choose products will now have options only limited to the one product that we both agree to engage in, right? Agree to uh, fix prices on. So the consumer's variety of choices reduce, right? And the consumers will have lesser options to choose. So the moment the competition disappears from the market, you are in a way also infringing the rights of the consumer, right? The consumer has a right and is entitled to the best quality of products, right? But if you and I try to collude and try to restrict the competition in the market, it is there where we need the government or the state to pick in and try to regulate. And that is where a law is needed, right? So we, we, we dealt with first what is competition. Now, why a law is needed? With respect to competition, as the single A competition law is in place, right? So we have a competition law uh, of uh, 2002 in India. Uh, obviously, earlier also we had law which was the MRTP uh, Act 1959, uh, which was repealed, and uh, in the uh, in the aftermath of uh, LPG liberalisation, privatisation, and globalisation, a competition act was brought in place to uh, to uh, pursue the and to further the needs of the uh, new uh, era in India and the new uh, age of globalization so that India is at par with the developed economies of the world and we allow trade to flow in and we allow competition to flourish. So uh, 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 briefly we had an act in, uh, itself in place even before 2002 but that was more conservative in nature, not going into the, um, again, the uh, what the provisions of the earlier 
still a war. Uh, but taking you to the present, uh, the current regulatory regime is the Competition Act. What are the various provisions? We'll go through the uh, slides uh, in a couple of minutes. But this is what the law is. To check if the competition is not being uh, prohibited in an unfair manner, something which is uh, detrimental to the needs of the consumer, detrimental to competition in the market, and a fair economy, right? So uh, this is the law in place. What would be uh, uh, now, uh, before I move on to speak on uh, what is the role of competition law and policy and the role of Competition Commission of India. It is uh, uh, under, important to know why competition is necessary, right? I told you about what is competition, why a law is Competition is necessary as such, you know, because it promotes allocated and uh, uh, allocated and productive efficiency of product in the market. It promotes innovation, like I said. It promotes consumer welfare and the economic and also strengthens the democracy. As we go through the uh, uh, as we go through this course, the one which we'll be conducting, you will see that you know how we will try to connect competition, how we will try to connect competition through uh, various dimensions. We try to connect competition from the IPR perspective, from the democracy perspective, from the political perspective. So once when you have a robust competition law framework in India, it also promotes democracy also promotes political political uh, 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 and economic stability in the market. Then, uh, uh, moving on to the roles of competition law and policy, I would like to tell you that competition uh, competition policy as such will have two elements. First will be your competition policy. One will be, the second will be a, a competition law. Now, as lawyers, you know, as lawyers and a couple of you from MBA grad, but a basic thing you would always know that, you know, before any law comes into place, there's a policy in place, right? But in India, when the competition uh, law was enacted, it was not enacted uh, behind the or premised on a policy in place. No, this was not there. In India, we still do not have a competition policy in place. We have a competition law in place. Competition policy as such, or for that matter, policy in general as such, it, it, it sets a framework for a set of policies. in the market and tries to give priority to the market forces which is in place. Right? I try to ensure that the entry and exit of players is free and fair. Entry and exit of uh, players is free and fair, right? And the idea is also, you know, when a, and a, when a regulator is in place, like Competition Commission of India, a regulator is in place, the idea is not to curtail competition. The idea is also to promote competition, right? So the idea is in a way to minimize regulation and, you know, and the state does not end up becoming a superpower, right? So uh, 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 if you would see, you know, through the course of the uh, lecture that we would take you through and also through the course, you would see that more of the economies across the world, right, developed economies, our Indian uh, economy competition law is nearly around 10, 15 years old. But the other jurisdictions have competition law which is 100 years old, right? So, which is uh, even beyond uh, 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 even beyond a century. So, you can understand the uh, the amount in which and the gravity in which and extent to which the laws pertaining to competition law are evolved in these economies, right? And that is why you would see most countries today are migrating to competition oriented and market based policy. And when we talk about law, you know, competition law in place. And vis-a-vis um, -vis the policy that I just explained to you, the idea behind having a law is, you know, to prohibit anti-competitive agreements and regulate potentially the mergers which have uh, uh, the competition on competition in the economy and prevent unwanted regulatory uh, uh, intervention, right? So that is the idea behind having a law in place. And it is not just India, but more than 110 countries across the world have a competition law in place. Now for 
even for that matter right now just not from the competition perspective as a lawyer you must know that we must have a policy in place which must be a guiding force a guiding light for an act to be legislated so in the case of competition law something akin to that the other committee was set up uh, to suggest changes to the then existing rtc law that i had mentioned to you uh, in order to make the competition framework in india in line or in consonance with the leading economies of the world so rabo committee report would be something akin to high of framework on which the act could be legislated right that would be the policy but something akin to you know like what i'm trying to explain to you uh, about what i'm trying to explain to you that you must have a policy in place to have an act a robust act the, uh, to be implemented uh, moving on to you know uh, uh, the role of competition comes in india explain to you there is a competition act to uh, check that you know unfair practices and for that matter anti competitive practices are not taking place in the market so we have a regulatory body called competition commission of india based in delhi and now also has a branch in chennai now uh, it's a quasi judicial body and uh, uh, what does it do it provides uh, the act provides to eliminate uh, certain anti competitive practices what these elements are just hold on for a minute and in the next slide i'll tell you what these practices are anti competitive practices abuse of dominance um which in the market so uh, so the idea is of the commission to check such practices which are uh, creating disruption in the market forces going beyond it it also has an objective to ensure that the interests of the consumers are duly protected and also ensures that there is a freedom of trade right now try to connect like i told you uh, from a very jurisprudential perspective that every act you know should have uh, a policy in place an act in place so we had the uh, act and then we had the uh, something ragban committee report not a policy but a set, set of guidelines now move on to uh, uh, when i say the role of the commission is to ensure freedom of trade try to connect it with the constitution of india article uh, 19 so also understanding the constitutional perspective to this uh, uh, body which has been set up right what is its objective and which article of the indian constitution for that matter directive principles of state policy article 19 of the indian constitution is is that is something that needs to be looked into while we are trying to examine the role of competition commission of india so this is uh, 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 something which uh, um, uh, that you need to keep in mind with respect to competition commission of india uh, uh, usually comp Competition Commission of India is is a exposed factor and um, uh, not ex ante except in case of merger that we I will tell you about and uh, yeah this is briefly about the role of Competition Commission of India um, before I move to the next slide I see a lot of hands being raised uh, Shanti do I need to stop to address few questions or can I proceed. Yes, Nidhi, you can. Uh, are there any questions for Nidhi? Do we have any questions? We had a couple of questions in the Q and A box. So somebody asked if uh, T Ramappa is it a good book to consult? Yeah. So I will just quickly answer you. Uh, yes, T Ramappa is a good book for you to uh, consult. But the problem with T Ramappa book is that you know it's a very well written book to understand the concept. but that book is not being updated so as far as i know that book has been uh, has had only one edition and all the editions which are coming are being revised edition so it is very important for you to read such a book wherein the latest amendments are being incorporated and unfortunately in the competition law we do not have such an update such people who are writing on competition law frequently 
in terms of books. So where is uh, you could access in terms of you know in that matter even this course uh, the kind of module design any textbook and we will have to go on a case by case basis to ensure that latest amendments and the recent changes with respect to law are being incorporated. So in the Mappa book you will not find uh, resources related to this. So for basics, yes. But uh, it is not something. So uh, moving on to the uh, next slide, uh, the Indian competition law, like I told you, uh, it was enacted in 2003. And uh, it was enacted in uh, January 2003. Commission was established a uh, couple of months later in October 2003. There are currently three members in the Competition Commission of India. Uh, the size was reduced by the Government of India by a recent amendment. Yeah, so uh, the current number of members in the CCI are three. Earlier, uh, uh, this number was reduced via an amendment. Um, the reason being that the government wanted to ensure more efficiency and they felt that, you know, uh, it would also uh, cut down some costs. So the number of members have been reduced. When I say phase notification and enforcement, by this I mean the entire act of competition commission uh, of the Com competition act was not notified in one go okay so section five and six were notified later so that is why it is say, said that you know it was a phase notification so, so first section three came into force then four into came into force and this was something which was notified phase by phase, phase by phase in and the enforced in a very phased manner so the entire act did not come into force at one go. So this is a brief, uh, a very theoretical thing that I wanted to tell you. But uh, this is something which you want, need to know. What does the act prohibit as such? So like I told you, the idea behind setting up uh, the commission was to uh, ensure that uh, the agreements having AAC, what does AAC mean? AAC means uh, uh, appreciable adverse effect on competition, including cartels. What are cartels? Cartels are something, uh, say for instance, I'll give you an example, right? Take the onion industry, right? So what happens that you suddenly see that, you know, prices of onions, uh, 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 onions is escalating in the market, or for, for that matter, uh, tomatoes, you know, the pri prices of the tomatoes are uh, escalating in the market for uh, reasons unexplained, right? There is a lot of production, there is a lot of uh, supply, but still, and there is an adequate demand, still uh, the prices are uh, not as per the market forces to the basics economy, like, right? you know, demand supply economics. It's not, in, it's not in, in line or in tandem with the basic economics. So uh, uh, what could be the reason? The reason is that, you know, traders are trying to get into some sort of an, a tacit agreement amongst themselves and trying to set a price for themselves such that, you know, it is detrimental again to the consumers. That is what cartel is about. So uh, the role of CCI is that, you know, we will come into picture and try to regulate such agreements, such agreements, which tend to have some sort of an appreciable adverse effect on competition, something which is significant, significantly affecting competition in the market, right? Then the second role of commission is to uh, check the abuse of dominant position. Say for instance, uh, uh, in, in this case could be any company for that matter, which is dominant and the government and the uh, commission would like to ensure that the uh, uh, company is not abusing its uh, uh, powerful position to harm the consumer. Say, for instance, tomorrow, uh, you know, there is only one oil company in the market, say, Safola, right? And there are other certain smaller oil companies or refined companies in the market. And Safola knows that, you know, because I am a dominant producer. Just understand by the basic meaning. What would dominant mean? Something powerful, right? Somebody who has a lot of control over the share in the market. So Safola says that, you know, um, I know I'm dominant in the market. Let's try to play with the consumers. And it tries to introduce certain schemes in which it would uh, 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 adversely impact the consumer. So what is it doing? It is trying to abuse its dominant position, all right? 
so uh, uh, say for instance a pola says that you know if you buy 1 kg of uh, uh, you uh, 1 kg of um, uh, safola oil you will also have to pay 5 rupees extra and get this toothbrush free with us right but i as a consumer do not want to uh, buy that toothbrush but that toothbrush is being tied to that product and and uh, uh, and safola is saying that you know you have to take this product free uh, along with the uh, oil that you're buying plus you have to pay 5 rupees extra for the toothbrush so what is it sapola knows that it has a certain shares of consumers and consumers will at any cost not change the oil right so what is it doing it is trying to abuse its dominant position that is what is abuse of dominant position and here the commission would again come in and try to ask sapola as to how you know why are you dominating the uh, you are dominating the uh, market and you are trying to also abuse the uh, uh, your position so in this case you have to as a reader understand that sapola as such being dominant is not problematic sapola when abusing its dominant position that is problematic because you know you and i everybody have a you know has a right to become a topper right but when you try to abuse your dominant position it is there the higher authorities will come to check you check on you so uh, uh, that is what abuse of dominant position is and combination is uh, something which you understand very basic combination is like uh, mergers you know mergers and amalgamation which tend to have uh, 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 could also again lead you to become a, a dominant player in the market say for instance tomorrow uh, um, some big companies uh, uh, for say colgate colgate and uh, pepsodent they merge right so they are big companies so one the, and two big companies when they tend to merge they will have a larger control over the market shares why is this problematic this is problematic because once uh, they come into picture together they tend to uh, uh, abuse the uh, dominant position so these mergers could as such become end up leading them to have a lot of market share and being dominant in the market and that is why these mergers could again be anti competitive now little bit uh, uh, i have already explained to you what anti competitive agreements are what uh, abuse of dominance but little bit if i could tell you from the uh, from legal perspective going section wise so like i told you horizontal agreements including why horizontal by vertical just understand basic horizontal the the line which we have the rulers consider it as a horizontal agreement where people where two players are at the in the same level is in the same chain right so that would be horizontal vertical like a ruler right you know you put the ruler straight and the players are arranged in a way that they are uh, uh, standing uh, vertical to each other right and here in case in horizontal they are parallel they are in the same market and in the same supply chain or the same uh, or, the, or in the same chain they are operating such that you know they are able to fix prices so in this case what would be the example of horizontal uh, agreements the pepsodent and um, pepsodent and colgate so they are uh, operating in the same market right so they could fix prices what could be a vertical agreement vertical agreement for that matter could be say uh, a car manufacturer okay so there is a car manufacturer and uh, a car manufacturer will have a lot of other uh, components to add to the production of a car so there are certain supply parts right there are certain motor parts so a motor company entering into an agreement with a car company so technically the motor company is not a car company but they would fall under the different chain but in a vertical position because without the motor company the car company would not be able to survive and without the car company the motor company will not be able to survive so they are vertically placed right so they tend to enter into agreements in such a way that they end up you know harming the consumers by uh, uh, entering into agreements which are anti competitive in nature so uh, horizontal agreements including cartels could mean uh, you are fixing prices like i told you about uh, 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 the tomatoes the onions right so they end up uh, fixing prices you try to limit or control production what is happening in the onion market that you are trying to control the production that there is demand there is also supply but what we will do we will only release that amount of onions in the market such that we are able to control the prices in the market right 
and then you allocate areas uh, 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 to consumer uh, allocate areas of consumers so you and i being leading producers in the market what i say you know we enter into an unsaid agreement oh you know this area you you take the consumers of this area and i take the consumers of this area no no this is legally wrong because you know as consumers i should have a right and i should have the uh, privilege of having access to all kind of products in my area right so i should not my choices should not be restricted and bid rigging is something you know we enter we have a lot of tenders taking places right you see tenders happening in the road construction industry so you are a contractor i am a contractor and we enter into an agreement you know let's put such bid together uh, that you know uh, uh, that is something uh, um, uh, feasible to both of us and we end up getting the contract but that is not good for the government right who's giving you the tender because the government would want the most efficient tender and the most genuine tender in terms of the bids being thrown to the government so in this way like a brief overview how this could be uh, 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 anti competitive agreement and how this could lead to uh, some sort of a, um, a violation of the indian competition law vertical agreements i gave you the example of uh, sapola right sapola and a toothbrush company so what is what what is happening in that you know that is an example of your time tying is actually that you know where sapola the the colgate company brush is trying to tie its product with the sapola uh, company and trying to sell the product so that is something you know two vertical uh, uh, agreements a vertical agreement is being signed and uh, that is again anti competitive nature uh, then exclusive supply and distribution refusal to deal resale price maintenance uh, very briefly uh, 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 very briefly uh this is again you know um, uh, say for instance i gave you an example of the hyundai motor car right so the supplier uh, the motor parts refuses to deal with a particular company uh, um, saying that you know no no we would not send you the motor parts and we would supply only to the hyundai company and not to say for that matter mahindra right so that is what that is refusal to deal that you are in, you are ready to supply your motor parts only to one company so that is uh, something which again you are vertically placed and you are trying to uh prohibit and restrict competition in the you are trying to restrict competition in the market and this is what is prohibited under section 4 of the indian competition act abuse of dominance like i told you again that dominance is not prohibited but the abuse is pro prohibited how is dominance defined like by logic you can say if you have a great market share and uh, you are some you can act in a way that you can create certain barriers to entry and it's for that matter size and resources or enterprises of com competitors is somehow you can prove that you know you are in a powerful position to regulate the market to to not regulate to control the market so that is what uh, 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 dominance is about and obviously uh, dominance could be exclusionary and uh, exploitative i would not go into this because you know we will have other slides but if i have to tell you briefly what uh, exclusionary would be is one example is predatory pricing that you know you try to keep the prices of the product very low and uh, you try to gain consumers so maine apna market mein prices ghata diya i reduce my prices and you as a consumer get attracted and you come running to me oh yes you know i want to buy this price uh, buy this product and the moment i have a large pool of consumers with me me i immediately increase the prices right so this is what uh, uh, predatory pricing is about and uh, uh, one uh, one example of exploitative uh, uh, pricing would be uh, something called as uh, discriminatory right that i try to discriminate between the consumers i try to charge higher what happens that you know you are traveling in flight and you are charged a higher price for a maggi but the same maggi is lower price when you are uh, uh, traveling uh, on train so you are trying to discriminate between the consumers so uh, that is what is uh, uh, discriminatory pricing is about and uh, then uh, moving down to regulation of combination this is covered under section 5 and 6 of the act section 5 is about regulation as to what constitutes merger one logical question which would occur to all of you is that if you and i enter into a merger is it anti competitive no there are certain threshold Tools which are being, uh, which has been given under Section uh, 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 Five and Six of the Act, 
and uh, uh, that if you breach those conditions in terms of the asset and the turnover limit it is only then you need to notify uh, if not uh, if you exceed those thresholds not breach if you exceed those thresholds and uh, uh, exceed those thresholds you are supposed to notify your merger to the commission that you know uh, uh, our merger is increasing the threshold limit and it is then you know the commission takes a call uh, uh, that uh, uh, whether this would lead to some sort of an adverse effect on competition in the market and it will have an anti competitive effect on the market right so what would uh, combination include like i said it would include merger amalgamation acquisition of shares so this is what merger would uh, include include and uh, the idea is that if you and i are companies and we both are dominant in the market and we end up merging and we go to the commission to notify that we are going to uh, our uh, com- our merger is notifiable under said section of the act the commission is bound to dispose of our case within 90 working days and if it the commission doesn't do so it would be deemed to be approved why is this provision given this provision is given for the cost of economic efi- efficiency now think uh, with a common sense that when big companies only big companies and conglomerates would go here right so they have lot of business stake involved to it they cannot hold on to the merger hold on the merger for a longer period of time so the idea is to also keep the merger uh, uh, smooth and efficient such that it does not it in, impact the turnover or the profits of the company and it is in the interest of the corporate industry this, this provision is being given under the act to ensure that the mergers are approved or for that matter checked or for the matter scrutinized at a decent and a reasonable uh, within a reasonable time framework so uh, this is something about the regulation of consumers uh, regulation of uh, combinations like i told you section 3 4 and 5 which is covered by the uh, uh, competition act and the idea of the commission is to uh, uh, keep a check on all these kind of practices just keep the three fold practices that i told you in mind and lastly uh, before i hand over my uh, uh, so hand over the presentation to uh, my colleague saksham quickly what remedy will you have under the act it is also important for you as a lawyer to know that okay these are my rights which have been violated or i have been affected in this way by a, a parent company or for that matter any rival in the market what remedy i can ask as a lawyer if you come as a client if you come to me what relief i can give you so this is the relief which you can give get under the act uh, a cease and desist order which means that the commission can uh, prohibit you and ask you to stop operating in certain way and this just can some simply discontinue such practices a penalty up to 10% of turnover can be charged in case of cartels again penalty is 10% of turnover or three times of the uh of the uh, cartelized profit whichever is higher uh, uh again agreements which have uh, the potential to cause appreciable adverse effect on competition will be considered to be void uh, uh, void and uh, in case of combination like i mentioned it can be approved it can be disapproved or it can be approved for with modification and uh, in case the commission finds that you and i are dominant in the price it can also order a division and uh, ask the companies to bifurcate such that the market shares uh, do not lie in a dominant um, in a dominant picture uh, in a dominant uh, phase uh, uh, leading to the detriment or a harm a harmful position to the consumers so briefly uh, this is what as a as a first timer you should keep in mind if you have to understand the basic competition law structure in india from the uh, law policy uh, framework law policy framework from the uh, perspective of uh, uh, the legal provisions that is 3 4 and 5 and after 3 and 4 and 5 as a client what remedy you can give uh, you have and as a lawyer what remedy can you give to your clients so uh, briefly yeah so now giving over the uh, 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 dais to now shyanshi she would take you further with the other section yeah thanks uh, shyanshi thank you nidhi that was a great presentation thank you all for attending and listening so far 
and i would really request you to stick around till the end of the session because we have a surprise for you but uh, till before we move on to saksham there are a few questions in the question answer box and in the chat box too so nidhi someone asked the question that can cci take suo moto cognizance against the organizations who are engaging in anti competitive practices or monopolization yes yes all right and uh, somebody even asked is if monopoly is permitted under the competition act by any chance uh okay so for that the answer in section uh, uh, 35 is also an answer to that where uh, um, it, monopoly as such is not permitted but uh, something similar for you uh, could be a good take away from you to go to the exceptions under which section 35 certain ipr agreements ipr uh, patents which are allowed you know because ultimately say for instance you have created a product i'm giving you an example from a very layman's perspective you've created a product and you would want that you know that uh, uh, i should have the patent right for this and not everybody should be allowed to use right so you are trying to restrict the rights of the other consumers from a very basic ipr perspective so the competition law as such uh, uh, exempt such exempt such uh, such agreements under section 35 of the act uh, from the scrutiny or scrutiny of the uh, competition commission of india and the competition act per se so uh, this is something similar to what uh, uh, you could find uh, an answer to your question but monopoly as such is not permitted uh, under the uh, uh, competition act even for that matter if a government is trying to uh, uh, say for indian indian railways right you cannot again uh, say that it's a, a mon monopoly because again it's it's a nationalized uh, entity so uh, uh, that is a, not a monopoly but a, a, something which is being uh, state run so uh, um, uh, as such monopoly is not uh, uh, is something which is not uh, allowed under the indian competition act and it does also doesn't have a mention about it okay that was a great answer we have some more questions but we will be addressing them towards the end of the session we do have a discussion portion allotted and towards the end of the session and we will be discussing all the questions you have for sure over there so please stick around till the end of the session your questions will definitely be taken up and answered don't worry so uh, without further ado i would request saksham to begin his portion of the presentation this is going to be a really interesting portion so do hang on tight guys at the end of it there's also a surprise waiting for you and definitely there's the doubt clearing session where all your issues will be resolved so saksham you can begin now hi <clears throat> thank you shanshi uh thank you for the kind introduction at the beginning and thank you nithi to clarify all the fundamentals of competition law really really well and that's going to be a tough one to follow but i'll try my best um i will now share my screen uh just give me a minute right so till this point what you've been told by nithi very well is that what is the relevance of competition law as it is as it stands what i want to put your attention to is what competition law could be or how competition law can evolve in response to the needs and the requirements of society uh, be it the increase in relevance of big tech be it uh, the relevance of data in the way we access services or be it the social justice angle so competition law like every other law does evolve and it has evolved over decades to what we see today wherein we have the consumer welfare standard firmly entrenched in the way we do competition law but in recent times we've seen a kind of a difference or a kind of an evolution in terms of what competition law could be uh, the first and the most important relevant part of this is the increasing relevance of digital markets and i think this is a change that we have seen within the antitrust community within the past 7 to 8 years and now in india at least we've reached a point where these changes are encouraging people to ask the questions which haven't been asked before for example do competition law tools which we've been following for decades do, are they still relevant if they are do they need to be adjusted if they need to be adjusted then how so i'll give you a few examples of that and then i will take you to other aspects of this uh, one of the things or one of the reasons behind why behind which i me talking about this is as competition law is you will have uh, you'll need to have a very firm understanding of the legal framework and how it is but uh, competition law and legal practice is not the only career option out there we have other avenues for example consultancy policy consultancy academia and research 
and as nidhi can probably uh, confirm with me one really important aspect of how you can excel in academia or policy for that matter is how innovatively or how creatively you can think of how you can just not not just ask the questions of why is this or why not this can happen so it is really important for you to keep asking questions uh, from anyone from every stakeholder ask questions from policy makers from the government by uh, about you know why is it this way and why not that way ask the cci ask lawyers ask anyone and everyone who is a stakeholder within the competition framework and that will essentially lead you to conclusions and that will lead you to areas that you did not think were possible for example a few years ago the idea of multi sided markets and network effects was unheard of but as soon as digital markets became more and more relevant now we are talking about the relevance of multi sided markets and how do they impact competition in the framework also considering that a lot of you are uh, in your first second and third year i will try and keep this since this is a very technical area i'll try and keep this to a more fundamental and a more uh, easier way of discussion so essentially digital markets as we've seen before as we've seen now are fundamentally same but also a little different from other markets for example one unique feature that we've seen of digital markets are are its multi sided nature a very good example of multi sided nature markets can be seen from the search engine industry or the search engine a lot of things so what happens is in a what happens in a traditional market for example let's say a uh, tomato ketchup right you have a producer or you have a couple of producers and you have consumers the consumers pay for ketchup and the producers give you the ketchup but what you see in digital markets can be a little different in certain circumstances for example in the search engine market what you can see is that i am a consumer of google or yahoo search for that matter but i don't pay them anything do i i mean the services are free but are they really free uh, how is google making money out of my search uh of my search activities so this is where the multi sided nature of the market comes into picture wherein google is essentially exchanging my uh eyeballs or my attention for advertising revenue so where there were only two players earlier the producer and the consumer there is one more player in the supply chain or the value chain so to say which is the advertiser so i pay google in a way so to say through my attention google sells that further to the advertiser and it's the advertiser that pays google now so this is the multi sided na uh, nature of market and again these statistics impose questions from competition authorities lawyers policy makers all around the world for example how do you characterize the market who are the relevant stakeholders how do you uh, determine whether the re relevant agency or the relevant uh, organization has a certain dominance in the market or not how do you characterize or how do you quantify the business of google in terms of the attention it receives from consumers do you use the number of search results do you use the number of do you use the revenue that it generates so these are kind of novel questions which have come up in the past few years which keeps uh, competition lawyers policy makers authorities on their toes and they are trying to <clears throat> resolve that another example would be network effects so network effects essentially means the value that is generated from an increasing number of uh, users being present on a flat platform for example when we calculate a uh, market power or market dominance we look at we look at a variety of factors we look at what is the market share of the business in the market we look at uh, <clears throat> we look at how long it has been in the market etc but network effects is a new feature for example um, let's say whatsapp right so whatsapp derives value or whatsapp increases its dominance so to say or market power so to say as more and more people join the platform for example if i'm using whatsapp it's a little difficult for me to move to telegram or to signal but it was all my friends on what are on whatsapp so that is an additional disincentive for me to switch from one uh, messaging app to another now this is something we haven't seen a lot of in markets before the digital age but now we're seeing so in contexts like these the question becomes okay so that is what it is but does that really make a difference to how concentrated the market is or how uh, how difficult consumer substitutability is how do you define the markets so these are the kind of things that are coming up and they do impact the way you think of relevant market the way you think of dominance the way you think of competition uh, concentration there's all these new things coming up which really necessitates that 
which really necessitates that you ask the right questions because right now the literature is still developing it is really mature in some jurisdictions but let's say in india which although is heavily influenced by the american and european literature the debate or the discourse is still developing so this is the right time for everyone to ask questions that okay is this the right way of doing things we have precedent but these are also unforeseen circumstances so do we need a new approach coming on the next thing uh challenges in digital markets as i've discussed already <clears throat> that so one more very important uh, factor in digital markets is the value of data or the value of uh, bit data so to say coming on the next slide so bit data as such has a lot of relevance in digital markets today bit data is not just a handful of data that companies use for business operations they derive value out of it as we discussed earlier the data that maybe let's say facebook or uh, any entity is collecting from me that becomes a product in itself you must have heard the age old saying that if a, that if a, <clears throat> sorry if a service is free then you are the service or if the product is free then you are the product which is essentially how it works so there are a lot of reasons behind why uh, tech companies are interested in big data so one of them <clears throat> would be for prediction of future circumstances or future business analytics uh where we say mitigating unforeseen events so the manner in which they can analyze consumer behavior and the way they've behaved on the platform on the for the past couple of months couple of years uh whatever time period they feel is feasible or is pertinent they can see how the consumer might just behave, uh, behave sometime next year for example if let's say i um okay imagine if facebook sells oranges so if facebook has been selling the oranges for the longest time it would be able to see okay that over the past 10 years according to the sale and purchase data that we have from consumer consumers the sales increase in the months of let's say june june and july where summers are at their worst so on the basis of that by analyzing that data so this is a very uh, rudimentary and a very basic example facebook will be able to make future business decision on when and where on what demographic it applies its advertisements for oranges for example so essentially the point being that big data has a lot of importance for tech companies today and that is why it has been uh, causing a lot of debate and discourse on how competition law should look at this or how competition should look at the relevance of data in competition law so a very a very new example of is jurisdictional thresholds uh, nithi discussed the earlier with you that in competition of frameworks of a lot of countries including india the fundamental idea behind this is that if companies or if entities have a certain asset or have certain uh, value of assets or turnovers the market power they have uh, as though the client of anti competitive behavior they could possibly engage in if they merge or if they or if one of them acquires the others are relevant for scrutiny and the commission needs to see whether or not this merger or this acquisition can go forward for example if i am an entity who produces steel and iron and i'm merging with an entity which only produces steel and let's say copper right now as far as the relevant market for copper and steel are concerned we don't have anything to worry about because their market power in these markets is not going to merge but when it comes to steel but since both the markets have an overlap and since both entities have an overlap in both these markets the commission needs to see whether or not <clears throat> whether or not uh, with their market power and after merging they this merger could have anti competitive effects or merger could have an appreciable adverse effect on competition in the steel market so this is how we have uh, proceeded traditionally and there are a lot of tests we have the size of transactional uh, size of transaction tests we have the assets and turnovers test now a problem that has been coming up in the digital age is that it's not just assets and turnovers for that matter which are relevant to see whether a certain merger should have competition scrutiny or not and this concern largely came up around 4 to 5 years ago when microsoft uh, acquired linkedin and that merger was not investigated by a couple of uh, major jurisdictions including india so that did lead to concerns because microsoft and uh, Lin- when microsoft acquired linkedin it would now have access to a host of big data not just because of its own operating system and other businesses but because of linkedin as a database also so this has started to acquire attention and different countries are trying to deal with this in different ways the way india is trying to deal with it uh, is what we've seen in the recent uh, competition law amendment which is still to be passed 
So what the amendment now says is that in addition to add the assets and turnover threshold, we, the government in consultation with the CCI can prescribe any other criteria also in public interest. Now, there are certain problems with that suggestion. I mean, on one hand, it's a good step because since uh, technology markets and the relevance of data in markets is constantly evolving. So what kind of thresholds we might need in the future are a little difficult to predict, uh, to predict. but at the same time, including the suggestion or including an amendment in the law saying that the government will have the power in consultation with the CCI to uh, you know, include any criteria in public interest and in public interest being terms which are not defined or which are not, which do not have a, you know, accepted meaning within competition or jurisprudence is going to invite uncertain, uncertainty for a lot of entities, in, especially entities in the big tech market. I mean, if I do not know whether or not my merger is going to, <clears throat> if, I merge, if I'm planning the merger right now, uh, let's say in January of 2022, and I do not feel that there is going to be competition scrutiny because there is no threshold as such, but by the time I come around to the merger, I come around to the transaction in December, in the meantime, the government has notified additional criteria due to which I am now uh, liable to notify the merger before the CCI. So that does lead to a lot of uh, uncertainty, but like credit to the Indian government that if not providing a certain or stable framework, it has at least kept the room open for future uh, modifications, which might be needed considering the dynamic nature of digital markets. So that is one of the ways wherein how data and Sorry. <clears throat> so the reason why this has been done is because now, even if they ha don't have the assets and turnovers, the data set or the big data they access might have uh, certain implications after the merger or transaction goes through. So that is one of the examples of how data and how the data that large companies, large tech companies for that matter possess, how that has an, uh, how that has a relevance or how that has a pertinent relevance for <clears throat> the competition framework. Uh, another debate or another discourse which is taking shape a lot nowadays is uh, the intersection of competition law and privacy. Now, there are a lot of arguments which are being made behind why privacy should not be a competition law concern or why it should be a competition law concern. And the way things are proceeding in major jurisdictions, including India, is that privacy is being considered an ancillary concern of competition law as we evidenced in the recent WhatsApp case. So CCI has taken some more cognizance of uh, WhatsApp's updated privacy policy. Interestingly, uh, WhatsApp's privacy policy was also scrutinized earlier by the CCI during the last update. And one of the fundamental points behind which, behind this instance uh, of competition or scrutiny going forward by the CCI, is that earlier the privacy policy of WhatsApp was optional and people could opt out of it. Whereas this time, the way the company has proceeded with it is it's either it's more of a take it or leave it kind of a situation. If I don't adhere to the updated privacy policy, I can't use it. So this is where the CCI says, okay, we understand that privacy, <clears throat> we understand that uh, the way you would want to, uh, want to implement privacy or the way you want to protect data of consumers is relevant. But we also have to see that whether or not consumers, do they even have a choice to use a certain service according to the terms they agreed to earlier or not? Now, concerns basically arise from a lot of reasons behind the updated privacy policy. According to the policy, there are concerns that now it will be easier for WhatsApp to share information and data of consumers with its parent entity or sister entities like Facebook and Instagram. And that does lead to a lot more uh, market power or that does lead to a lot more say that Facebook and Instagram has on how you would want to, how they can advertise products to us or how they can pitch their advertising models to advertisers and, you know, sell the updated model because now they have better, more accurate, almost perfected to a granular manner of our behavior, our psychology, the way we think, the way we shop, it's everything. So that is why data becomes very relevant for consumers. And that is why it's being scrutinized by competition authorities in India and across the world. So this is what it is uh, about the relevance of big data and digital markets in general and competition law. Before I move to another, let's say, relatively new intersection of competition law, which is social justice, I would be happy to answer any questions that might be there.
Yes, Saksham, there are a couple of questions. Uh, so Karthik has asked a question on the question answer box and it is a big one. So it goes like with respect to the concerns regarding big data, the companies are using their resources to generate such big data to better serve the interests of the other consumers, which is in consonance with the idea of innovativeness as promoted by competition law. So shouldn't this be a factor be this so shouldn't this factor be considered by competition authorities while determining the abusive nature of big data held by big companies because they are putting in their resources and being innovative to serve the consumers that is a valid point and that is so as i said these discourses and these debates are in the <clears throat> initial stages of being developed and there are proponents for both sides of the debate wherein of course innovation is a goal of an effective uh, competition policy and it is brought up in a lot of uh, cases for that matter. I mean, the recent one I can remember is now. So there is a whole debate between behind the manner in which Google Play Store and Apple App Stores, the way they, uh, you know, the way they cement their positions or the way they cement their positions in various markets. So one of the reasons or one of the pertinent instances is that now Google Play and Apple Store now as an, as an app developer, as an app developer, when I register on the, or when I put my app on these play stores, these companies ask me to, <clears throat> uh, these companies mandate me to use the payment systems of these companies as well. For example, I have to use Google payments. If I want to process payments for any in-app purchases I might have, for example, let's say Spotify. Now Spotify wants to be listed on Google play store, any in-app purchases, for example, of any in app purchases, for example, of, um, of let's say the Spotify premium subs subscription needs to be processed through the rural payments, wherein it will, Google will take a 15 to 20% commission. Now, app developers say that, okay, what it does is that it fosters a sort of a monopoly or a sort of a dominance in the payment systems market. And also it hurts our business model because innovation is stifled on this end. Like for example, they say that if we do not have the necessary resources for research and development, because we're given away such a huge chunk of our resources to, uh, for inflammation, it obviously hurts our incentive or hurts our uh, ability to innovate. On the other end, Google and Apple say that, okay, but this is the, the way we've reached here at this point where every app wants to list on our platform is because we have innovated constantly. So essentially, if you ask us to take away this requirement, you are in a way punishing us for being innovative. So innovation is always going to be a relevant factor, but at the same time, you have to weigh a lot of things. You have to weigh the interests of a lot of stakeholders. I mean, at the same time, let's say, because Facebook has access to all this data, it is able to target ads to us, which we obviously would want, like we would want to buy those things. So it serves me a better, let's say it serves me a better interest as consumers to get a lot of ads, which are relevant to me rather than going through a lot of junk. But at the same time, did I permit or did I, uh, can, or did I agree to this, uh, in, uh, sharing of data or not? So these are a lot of contradictory and a lot of, uh, rivaling considerations that you have to take in mind. So yes, like in summing, uh, innovation is a relevant, uh, consideration in big tech, but it also matters on how you see it and who's the relevant stakeholder in mind. Should I move ahead? Yes. And, uh, yes. In privacy. Okay. I'll, so in like, let me just quickly answer Niranjan's, uh, question. I mean, before I forget in case privacy law is enacted in India, will this complement the competition act to tackle issues that we discuss on WhatsApp. Now this is an answer, this is a question not even policymakers have the answer to right now. Due to a couple of reasons, A, the PDP bill is constantly being revert, it's been delayed, so we don't know what's going to happen. However, one of the conflicts that you will see for sure is the jurisdictional conflict between the D Data Protection Authority, which will come up, and the CCI. And the way this proceeds, we it remains to be seen. So we can't say that it will complement, it should, but there might just be conflicts as well. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> so social justice, right. So I need to sum up in the next five to six minutes. We are running out of time. So I will be quick with this, right? So 
as I was discussing earlier that competition law and your role in competition do, does not only need to be of what competition law, law is, but what it could be. And I will really skim through it because I have a very important uh, slide to discuss with you, which is careers. And I think that is going to be more relevant for you rather than the technical topic of uh, social justice. But to sum up or to shorten up this section is that this is a proponent that has received encouragement in the US and has now starting to receive encouragement outside, uh, including India, wherein I'm trying to make meaningful contributions is that the focus of competition law and competition law policy, more importantly, needs to move out of or needs to move, you know, needs to complement other things as well, not just the consumer welfare and not just uh, competition in the market, but social justice for that matter. And the question here is that why not? Why shouldn't competition law focus on social justice? Competition law right now is focusing on digital markets because it's increasingly relevant for people. But the kind of inequality we've seen in terms of social economic resources is also very relevant. So why not we do that? So in a lot of ways, in a lot of manners, people are arguing that it's not possible because competition does not have the required statutory and policy tools to do that. But we've seen in the past that it's not really true. The South African competition policy for that matter does that. The South African competition policy provides that, for example, if when they have to, uh, when the competition authority there has to review a merger and it has to analyze its anti-competitive fits, it will see whether or not this merger will have an impact on the businesses or on the economic interests of its uh, African majority. And because the African majority there has suffered uh, due to apartheid over the past two decades, it wants to protect their interests. For example, recently Burger King was uh, going to acquire an entity through a private equity firm in South Africa. But the reason that merger was not <clears throat> was not approved because that would have the merger would have essentially reduced the shareholding of the black major of the African majority there to almost zero percent. So it wasn't given uh, an approval. So this is an example of how social justice can be made an important part of competition law and policy. Um, gender and class for that matter have a role to play. I mean, we do not have the time to get into this, but briefly, if I tell you, gender has a role to play in competition law is something which is being, uh, which is being discussed in the OECD as well and other jurisdictions. India recently seen debate on this. I was surprised and I was pleasantly surprised to see that a few months after the article, someone from a government agency reached out and told me that, oh, now they're trying to research on competition law and gender as well. So it's going to take time. And it's essentially the idea that you ask the questions, why not? And why shouldn't social justice be a relevant part of competition law? And that is where you'll see interfaces like gender, caste, uh, income inequality, racial inequality, all of that coming up and being addressed by competition law tools as well. So, I mean, I'm going to just skim through this because I think this is what is more relevant. So starting with the obvious law firms, almost every tier one law firm in the country has a competition law practice. The way to give you some insight in not inside information, to give you some insight on the way market is concerned in the competition law uh, practice here in India is most of the big tech clients belong to uh, most of the larger firms in the tier one or the top four or five. Whereas the smaller firms, let's say more boutique firms deal with clients or have clients more on the informant side or the CCI side. So essentially, if you want to make a career in law firms in the competition uh, law, it's fortunately become easier than it was until four to five years ago, because at the time where firms would always require some sort of PQE in competition law, be it in a research capacity or in a practice in capacity, or at least an LLM, that hesitance has largely disappeared and people and law firms are more and more likely to look at people who have the displayed an interest in the field in the past, let's say two, two and a half years of their uh, law college. So if law firms are one of the target areas, I mean, it's suggested that you start uh, interning, you start writing papers on competition law. Essentially, you have focus towards the area because it's a niche area and it's not, a uh, not similar to other general practice areas like dispute resolution or general corporate where you can uh, pass off as a journalist. Here, you have to have some sort of specialization so that is their independent practice, of course. Now, as I told you earlier, so a lot of business in competition law is uh, thwarted by law firms, and some of that does remain for boutique law firms and independent independent practitioners. 
Having said that, we have seen a lot of uh, independent practice people, uh, you know, make their mark in competition law and establish, uh, let's say, well-developed practices, uh, including Nidhi for that matter, does uh, do competition cases. So it's there. Uh, essentially, what is really suggested if you want to do go into competition practice independently is that you obviously, as with any other field within litigation, you start out with a senior because not only is it important for you to learn code craft and your uh, to learn the procedures, but also the practical implications of competition law practice. So that's there. Uh, we have public policy where I operate essentially. So the area of public policy, to be very honest, is surprisingly for me at least when I first entered, is very very interesting. It allows you to look at things from a more macro level. Competition in the public policy space is there. We have think tanks like Lutz International. We have places like ISCA. We have uh, Vidhi for that matter. Most large national think tanks are now establishing uh, competition verticals. I myself am trying to establish a competition vertical with a few uh, think tanks. But the policy space has a lot of worth, especially if you want to, uh, let's say, even in the policy space, it's not just think tanks or civil society organizations, even tech organizations. I So every uh, tech law firm, for example, Instagram, Facebook has a public policy vertical. Even lesser known of companies like Tashfree or Dunzo, they have public policy verticals and they require more of an approach where you are more well versed at the technology side of things, tech law and policy, but competition is a relevant area wherein they'll see, okay, you don't only understand the way the business works, you also understand the way the market works. So you have that opportunity. Academy of Research, I think Nidhi would be the better person to uh, discuss that later since she's spent a fair bit of amount of time in Academia. But yes, you have a uh, scope of uh, entering into Academia. Unfortunately, doing the master's in Indian competition law is still a little difficult because we do not have a lot of law schools offering it. So a lot of people do go abroad, let's say to King's College and LSE, etc., to do their master's. So that will always be an option. You have Europe, you have US for that matter. I mean, these jurisdictions have a lot of really, really uh, good competition law masters. In house rules, not too much at this point, but it's cropping up because in house rules are required to be a lot more, uh, have a skill set which is a lot more general, uh, essentially to have a skill set which will uh, encompass, let's say, labor laws, which will do that transactional uh, skill sets, due diligence, uh, dispute resolution, all of that. But what we are also seeing now, again, in tech companies are roles coming up for competition lawyers, essentially. But these are roles which are more uh, which are mostly uh, meant for people with a lot of experience. But as competition law starts to become more and more relevant for not even bit late, but even outside of it, uh, there's a chance that we will see in-house roles become a bit more specialized, have some more verticals, and competition is going to play uh, an important part there. Literature development, essentially course development, you can work for organizations like uh, Law Purpose for that matter, and even internationally where you can assist them in developing the required courses. And that is, uh, that's the route you can take. Competition Commission, CCI in India, Nidhi, as uh, she discussed, has worked there. CCI does require at least a year of experience, a year, year and a half of experience in competition law for you to be onboarded as a research assistant, but it's a really illuminating and a really exciting career option, I feel, because you get to see things from the inside. You get to work with the DG and the economics division and all of that divisions, and you see how things happen behind the doors. So that's going to be a very relevant area for all of you, I feel, but that's something, I mean, Nidhin can correct me later if I'm wrong, but does require a fair bit of experience, at least a year of experience before the CCI will consider you for a position. Economics of competition law is very, very uh, extremely nascent, I would say, and extremely niche for that matter. Even uh, competition lawyers with, let's say, three, four, five years of experience are not very well versed with how the economics part or the economic analysis part of it works. Even in law firms, a lot of the economic work is on uh, is outsourced to other organizations like PwC, EY, Deloitte, all these uh, places. But uh, what I am seeing in the past couple of years, and this is more more uh, prevalent among the experienced lawyers is that they are trying to understand the economic side of things to differentiate themselves from other lawyers and present a new value addition or a new USP for clients. So that is a very nascent and a very niche area. And if someone has an interest in, let's say, uh, the economic side of things, has done a BCom for that matter or an MCom and an LLB, 
and wants to go in that direction is something which has precedence and which has which is something you can look forward to. So to sum up, yeah, you'll yeah you'll make money if you do competition law, not a problem. Yeah. Thank you, Saksham. That was a very informative session. I'm sorry that things had to be a little rushed, but we did have a bit of a time crunch. And uh, for the students who found the session super informative and useful, like I did, I have a lot of uh, I have very good news for you to share. Uh, I have very good news to share with you. So whatever you've learned in this webinar, uh, be it the basics of competition law, be it information about you know competition law and its interaction with other thematic areas. Locktopus Law School is launching a course on competition law. And we are launching this course on the 5th of January. This is going to be a three month long course, which will go until the 5th of April. And since this course is going to cover everything that has been discussed in this webinar in greater detail and a lot more other topics. So there was somebody who asked a question in the Q&A box that, you know, any courses and diplomas in this field, can you suggest any? So this course is a very extensive, intensively crafted course, which is going to be your be all and end all solution to all your questions about competition law. So I would definitely recommend you doing this course because you would get a lot of insight about the area and the practice. You will know more about the fundamentals. You will know how it works in practice. Basically, you will uh, it will be covering all aspects in a very comprehensive manner. So basically what we will be covering in this course is you will be learning about the different legislations, the international national legislations in this domain. You will be understanding fundable, fundamental concepts which Nidhi discussed in greater detail. And you will be also understanding a lot of landmark decisions that the CCI has taken. You will be learning a lot of practical skills also, which is how do you bring a case before the CCI? How do you defend your client before the CCI? How do you file a merger notification? This is one very practical skills a competition lawyer requires. You will know more about concepts about private enforcement, comparative competition law, dawn raids, leniency programs, major sectors under scrutiny, such as e-commerce sector, the cab aggregator service sector, all the news that we see in daily life, you know, all of that will be covered in the module in a theoretical and a practical manner too. You will also learn about very interesting, unique concepts such as interaction of competition law with areas such as data, IPR, gender, gender, data privacy. And somebody asked a question in the chat box about competition law, the scope of competition law mixed with IPR. So this course will definitely be covering that in greater detail. And lastly, and most importantly, this course will also be talking about how you make most of your time in college pursuing competition law, because Saksham just mentioned that if you are interested in this field of law, then you have to show that you are interested in this specialization all throughout your college in some way. So how do you make the most of your time there that is also covered by this course and how you monetize, you know, your skills as a competition lawyer that is also covered in this course really well. And Saksham has done a great job writing it. And Nidhi has done a brilliant job covering all those things, all the things that I mentioned in a great detail. So if this webinar has been super useful and informative for you, I would definitely encourage you to check out the course. So this course, like other Locktopus courses, it's completely online. It has recorded videos and live sessions. There are modules also which have reading resources and these resources have been prepared by people, Saksham and Nidhi, who have worked in the field of academia and policy and litigation too. There are a lot of exercises at the end of every module, and these are very practical exercises which will help you test your skills on competition law. There are different assignments also which will help you test your knowledge, your advisory, and your application skills. These are all very fun, challenging exercises, but easy to do also. So you will learn a lot if you do this course. There's also an online forum where you can resolve your doubts easily. You can even raise your issues in the live sessions and they will be taken care of. And of course, since it's a law octopus course, we promise you a very warm, fun and caring learning experience. And there are benefits to doing this course. Not only will you get a lot of knowledge, but this course is self-paced and you know, it really saves a lot of your time. Within three months, you will be very well-versed with competition law and you know, you will be ready to take on your competition law internships. And if you're a lawyer who's interested in competition law, it will give you a very good refresher, a very good background into this area and it will help you take on, you know, a few assignments relating to competition law. Once you finish this course, you will get a certificate of completion. Our top learners also get letters of recommendation. 
so it's a very lucrative course if you want to join it that way and if the surprise that i had been talking about so uh, people who have attended this webinar and stayed on right towards the end you get a 15% waiver and early bird discount if you use this course which is given on the screen it is lls it is lls cmp 15 so if you register for the course which is starting in january you know you can get a 15% discount using this code and if you have any questions you can call snigdha ghatak who is our career counselor given on the number here so for any information you can check out this link also i will also put the link on the chat box right now and i will also um, i would I, I will put this link on the chat box right now and i will also put the code again and uh, i would really encourage you to check out this course once and definitely fill the feedback form which i will also be sending right now on the chat box we would love to hear your thoughts about the course uh, about the session we would definitely love to hear your feedback about this i will put this on the chat box and uh, while i'm doing that i will again pass on the mic to nidhi and saksham for any other questions or doubts people might have so uh, going back to this uh, there was somebody who had a question who they sent exclusively to the hosts and panelists so i would request you to send your questions on the question answer box can cinema theaters be sued for charging more on food items considering cons uh, consumer differentiation yeah uh, hi uh, shanshi thank you so what i did you know meanwhile i i tried to answer all the questions that was there i tried to answer everybody's question so that mm -hmm. nobody is left uh, in a doubtful position after the webinar that's brilliant uh, yeah. thank you nidhi yeah so uh, if you have a follow up question to the answers i have given to all of you which i'm sure you'll be able all of you must be able to see the answers the question that i have uh, 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 that has been raised so happy to answer a follow up question to the answers that i have given i've tried to explain cartels also what is aec i've tried to explain that also everything so maybe i could answer one bit that i had thoughts on what saksham said and uh, something that i have been working on privacy and data uh, data privacy and competition online if i could add to that see you have to always understand like a lawyer think like a lawyer if an issue of privacy is concerning right any any or if an issue of competition violation is being is, is before you how would you think as a lawyer think like a lawyer uh, 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 what does the preamble of the act says what does the preamble of the competition act says what does the preamble of the constitution of india says if there is a violation of privacy which of your fundamental right is being violated which court will have a jurisdiction so you know when people question about you know there is a jurisdictional issue one clarity should always be there go to your basic document constitution right and you would know uh, where the separation of power lies and who has the jurisdiction to deal what kind of violation of your rights being taken taking taking place so for instance if know the you know that the uh, object of uh, competition law is not to protect privacy if you have a violation of privacy you go to other forum but if you have a violation with respect to competition you go to the commission cci goes with same goes with when you have sectoral conflicts like you know regulatory conflicts all of these readings that you uh, go through about regulatory conflicts sectoral conflicts if you keep as a reader and as a lawyer what i have realized while framing my arguments that if you keep the idea in your head very clear that which is the right forum for me to go that you can decide by understanding the nature of the violation and where that violation has a remedy to so you know that a violation has a remedy under the competition act you would go to the commission right if your privacy is being violated then you have an other forum for that now the question comes as to what aspects of data privacy can be taken into account by the comp by the competition commission of india if any data which is being used by the company which violates the Uh, uh, privacy of the consumers, and that also leads to undue advantage and 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 a scruple or or, or say uh, immense profit to companies uh, to the deb, uh, such at the cost of the privacy of the consumers. Then definitely that commission should should pitch in into that and take into that. But again, commission would penalize you for abusing your 
dominant position not for violating the rights of your privacy because the act does not say even if the act commission has a good intention to protect your privacy but unfortunately commission will do only what the act says right so the provision provision of law has to be there and again unless the bill comes into the act uh, data protection act comes into place so that will lead to an, another area of debate and uh, uh, remedies for the consumers and the uh, corporations mm, with respect to in conflict between competition and uh, data privacy but for the moment the status quo is this and same goes with the whatsapp case also again you have to go to the intermediary regulations what does the intermediary regulation says not the competition act right so you must know where the law is where your violation is taking place under which law and where do you have the remedy for that uh, uh, for that uh, violation being taking place then all your doubts will be clear that's it thanks nidhi that was really helpful and for all those who had questions in the q and a box and the others who had the similar questions nidhi has nidhi and saksham both of them have typed amazing answers to all those questions so i would really request you to check out the answered portion tab on the q and a box if you want answers to those questions does anybody have any other questions about the course about anything related to competition law our faculty is here or uh, if you have any other questions please feel free to ask if you have any questions about the course please feel free to contact snegdha her number is given there on the screen uh, you can even check out the link which is given here and uh, please uh, check out the course and uh, you know the information is there on your screen but uh, if any but nobody has any questions for now i would uh, thank you all for attending it has been so great to have you all as our audience and it's a pleasure to be able to serve you in any way possible and help you all understand this exciting area of law thank you so much for being so committed to your learning and i hope to see most of you at register for this course hopefully uh, thank you all for coming have a great evening ahead thank you nidhi and saksham for giving us the time and taking so much time and you know patience and giving us so much information about competition law and really helping the learners understand this area better it was a very informative session thank you all for being here and uh, thank you sanjeev thank you thank you have a good night and uh, i will end the session here now